good morning, everybody. We are ready to go here. So let's go ahead and stand if you would. Get those masks on if they're not, because we're going to be singing momentarily here. But as we begin, why don't you listen as Noel reads uh, Psalm 100 as our call to worship this morning. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Sing to this king of love. The king of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his.
paraphrasing words from Psalm 23 remind us of who we're gathered to worship this morning, this one who's our king, our father, our friend, and um, who walks with us through all the seasons of our lives. I want to invite you to do it as we do most weeks, and that's we're just going to pause for a moment and to remember that God is in our midst. It's an incredible thing that we're just not gathered for a performance or some kind of uh, formal get together. We're here to meet with the living God and to give him all of our praise this morning, all of our worship. So let's just bow our heads and be quiet and remember who is with us this morning. Lord, as we come to you, we remember that uh, we need you. We're not here to offer you something that you uh, couldn't get on your own. We're here just simply to come as your children who have been uh, redeemed by the work of your grace and to say thank you. And we need you, Lord, to continue to, to call us back to you again and again, to remind us who we are in Christ. And so, Lord, as we uh, continue to sing, make music in our hearts and with our voices, as we come to be fed by your word this morning, um, we just remember our complete dependence on you. And we pray that you'd come and you would meet each person according to their needs uh, and bring us what we can't uh, do for ourselves, that you would bring by your Holy Spirit the encouragement or comfort or conviction uh, that we need to follow you. So thank you that you're here among us, God, and we pray that you'd be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Lord, I come. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you oh Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need I need you, Lord, I need 
one defense. You're my one defense. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Amen. Why don't you take a seat? You are welcome at this point to uh, take your masks off as Chris comes to give us a little missions report and lead us in prayer. Good morning, church. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, Glad you're here, whether you're with us in person or watching from home. Glad you decided to worship with us this morning. Uh, My name is Chris Comstock, and before I lead us in a time of prayer, I get to share a little bit about uh, an organization I work with called Crew, um, which I'm a supported missionary from Santa Barbara Community Church, and uh, it's a campus ministry, and I work at UCSB, and our, our mission is to give every student an opportunity to hear the gospel and enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we really desire to see students set a trajectory uh, with their lives towards lifelong discipleship to Jesus. That's what we're about. And so I wanted to share with you an encouraging story. Um, this has been a strange year for, I think, for all of us. It's, at least it's turning out to be a pretty strange year, and it was similarly so for ministry. But there were some things that God was doing um, before COVID in the BC days. And so I'm going to share a story with you uh, about just a cool a cool instance. Um, we have a ministry called Destino, which uh, reaches out to Latino students on campus, and that's about 30% of our campus. And in the fall, they were having their first weekly meeting. And a student, a uh, transfer student by the name of Brent, um, wandered into their, their first weekly meeting. Uh, turns out he was looking for a different club, um, but he ended up at Destino. And um, they welcomed him in. And one of our interns named Kevin invited him to, um, to join them for some food after the meeting. And so they all went over to Denny's and enjoyed some food. And Kevin got to know Brent a little bit in his story. And Kevin uh, felt compelled to, to try to meet up with him again. And so um, said, hey, Brent, why don't, we, why don't we meet up? I'd love to grab coffee with you and get to know your story a little bit more. Turns out Brent is from the same area of L.A. as Kevin, um, has a Catholic background. Kevin grew up with a Catholic background. So they were able to, to bond along those, those lines. And um, Brent shared that he, he didn't really know much about uh, the Bible or about Jesus, but respected, respected Jesus, respected the Bible. And so Kevin felt like, man, I'm going to share the gospel with Brent. And, and so Kevin p- continues to, to share uh, the gospel and what it means to have a relationship with Jesus, with Brent, and um, asked Brent if he wants to pray to trust Christ. And there was this pause, as Kevin tells me, and, and Kevin kind of felt like, oh, man, did I push too hard too soon? You know, I just met this guy. Um, but the pause was because Brent was really thinking about it and, and was really wondering, well, how do I, how do, I do that? I don't, I'm not familiar with how to pray to, to start a relationship with God. And so Kevin led him in a prayer of faith, and, and Brent put his, his faith in, in Christ that day. Um, what's so encouraging about that, not only that, that Brent passed from death to life and entered into a relationship with Jesus, um, but that he has stuck around. Um, Kevin is now discipling Brent and going through follow-up materials and just helping him mature as a disciple of Jesus, and, and now Brent's going to be one of our key leaders uh, next year for Destino. So just be encouraged that God is at work in students' lives at UCSB. Um, and, you know, we, we did have to transition when students went home in March, just so you know what things look like. Uh, it was different. We, we moved all our stuff online. We have uh, Zoom weekly meetings, Zoom discipleship, Zoom small group Bible studies. But students really wanted to connect. They stayed plugged in. Even when they moved home with their parents, I think that actually might incentivize them to want to stay connected. But they stayed connected to us, and, and people are growing in their faith. Um, would covet your prayers for this fall. We're a little uncertain what UCSB is going to look like with freshmen coming in, if that's going to happen or not. We really work hard to reach freshmen that first four weeks, so we could, we could really use your prayers for what that's going to look like, um, that students would come with open hearts and open minds, and we would be prepared in whatever capacity to, to meet them with the gospel and, uh, and love on them. So, Well, I'm going to transition us to a time of prayer right now, um, but before I do, I'm going to read an excerpt of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. Pray with me. Lord, you are our refuge when we need shelter in this world. 
You are our strength when we are weak. We rely on you. Our hope is in you. Jesus, you said in this world we would have tribulation, but to take heart that you have overcome the world. And we, your people, believe that to be true. You are the one who dwells in the midst of your people, your church. You are the one who brings us joy and makes us glad. And you are the one who keeps us from being moved, from being shaken along with the world around us. You are our help and our rescue, and we praise you for that. But Lord, our our world is in trouble. A global pandemic threatens lives and livelihoods, governments, economies, the education of our children, exacerbating tensions and creating instability. Lord, our world is in trouble. Realities of racial injustice and inequality are propelled to the surface after centuries of unrighteousness in our nation. Lord, our world is in trouble. As people lose hope that life will be able to get back to normal again. But you are our refuge and our strength. You are a present help in times of tumult and upheaval. Would you be that refuge for us right now? Would you draw near to bring your help and rescue to a world that's been shaken to its foundations? Jesus, we ask you to be in the midst of this pandemic, protecting the vulnerable and healing and speeding the recovery of those who are sick and on ventilators because of the virus. Lord, would you be with our frontline medical workers as they act as your healing hands, as your comforting voice during this time? Would you protect them from sickness? Would you comfort them as they witness the death of others? Jesus, would you be with our nation as we seek to navigate issues of racial injustice? Would you convict us of sin both personally and corporately in our complicity with racial injustice in our country? Would you create a godly sorrow that produces repentance, a repentance that leads to healing in our nation and in your church? And Lord, would your church, made up of so many tribes and tongues and nations, be the leading voice for racial justice and equity in our nation? And Lord, we also want to pray for our law enforcement officers, both locally and nationally. Would you help our law enforcement officers to be instruments of true justice and righteousness, as well as your mercy? And would you help them to protect the vulnerable, to restrain evil, and to work for the good of all people that they come in contact with? And would you protect them from harm in the midst of it all? Jesus, we also want to lift up the local body of believers in Santa Barbara. It is difficult for the church to be the church right now in so many ways. Would you give your church in Santa Barbara creativity and perseverance to live out the communion of the saints in the midst of it all? Lord, I want to pray for a few churches by name, for Reality Santa Barbara, for Calvary Chapel and Anthem Chapel, for Community Covenant, and the Chinese Evangelical Free Church, for Calvary Baptist and Ocean Hills, for El Cavario and Greater Hope Missionary Baptist Church, would they continue to be a powerful witness to Santa Barbara of your grace and your love and your power? Would you sustain them and provide for their needs? Lord, we also want to lift up our own congregation of Santa Barbara Community Church. Jesus, would you continue to bring comfort to the Colburn family as they grieve the unexpected and tragic loss of Galen? Draw near to the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. And Lord, we pray for those in our church family who are wrestling with physical limitations, with mental health struggles, with the loss of a job, with the loneliness that comes with social distancing. Would you provide for their needs and may the body of Christ be a part of meeting those needs? Lord, we lift up all these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to lead us in uh, reciting the Apostles' Creed. We've been uh, studying the Apostles' Creed for several weeks now and as a way to consider the fundamentals of the Christian faith and also to remind us that we are connected to so many other believers around the world who say the same creed. So would you please join me in saying the creed together? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'm going to invite up Benji now. Thank you, Chris. Well, I have the privilege right now of getting to introduce Mandy Dupar, and many of you have probably never had the opportunity to benefit directly from her teaching ministry and her teaching gifts, but for the last three years, Mandy has been giving oversight and leadership to our ministry to our fifth and sixth grade, as well as seventh and eighth grade students, and I know they have found what we have found, that she has a gift for teaching, and we are so thankful for her love for the scriptures, her love for our students, and her love for our church, and Mandy was originally supposed to make her preaching debut here um, back in March, and then like so many other things in 2020, COVID ruined that, and so we are really excited about today, excited to have you teaching us, and so um, if these were normal times, I would lay my hand on her shoulder and pray for her, but I'm, I'm going to stand awkwardly like this and pray for you nonetheless, so church, invite you to join me in praying for Mandy. Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you for the gift of your word, that it is living and active, and it is able to continue to shape our hearts and our community to look more like Jesus. And we pray that you would do that very thing in these next few minutes through your servant, Mandy. Lord, thank you for her evident gifts. Thank you for the ways that she loves you and loves your scripture. And Lord, I pray that for these next few minutes, you would fill her again, fill her anew with your Holy Spirit animate her words, enliven our hearts so that we might look more like you and have our hearts more aligned to you at the end of this time. And Lord, we pray ultimately that we would hear from you through your servant Mandy. So work through her and in us, we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. All right. Well, I am delighted to be here this morning and to get to be with all of you in person. It feels like such a treat still to be able to see faces and unmasked faces. So good. Well, um, to get us started this morning, I'm going to tell you a, a childhood story. Um, I am the eldest of three girls in my family. My middle sister, Aubrey, is two and a half years younger than me, and my youngest sister, Sammy, is six years younger than me. And it's because of this more substantial age difference between Sammy and myself that I have some pretty distinct and clear memories of her as both a baby and a toddler. And as a toddler, Sammy was the sweetest, purest, kindest, itty bittiest, like I can't think of enough superlatives to describe her. She was just the best little toddler that ever there was. And um, she had a pureness about her, but also her countenance. She had these tight curls that were just a mop on top of her head. She had these dark brown eyes that would scrunch up and disappear whenever she smiled or laughed. And I kid you not, she looked like the spitting image of Shirley Temple. My family and I, we called her Shirley all the time. And I describe Sammy's countenance, her demeanor, and her stature to you because I think it makes this story that I'm about to tell that much funnier. Because like I said, Sammy was all goodness and sweetness bundled up into one little five-year-old package. But whenever Sammy got mad at Aubrey or myself, specifically whenever she thought that we were saying something untrue, like, Sammy, stop being so sensitive, or Sammy, Barney isn't actually a real dinosaur. Um, it was as if a storm cloud came over her. She would just stand there, put her little hands on her little hips. Her face would just contort into this grimacing scowl, and she would jab her pointer finger in our faces and yell, you're lying to me, and you're lying to God. <laughs> Over, it happened so many times throughout our childhood. And most of the time, whenever Sammy said this, Aubrey and I would just crack up. We would lose it because most of the time we weren't even lying. We were just stating a fact or an opinion. Um, 
But as I look back on these encounters with Sammy, I realize that her accusations, even though many times unfounded, actually held some sound theological underpinnings to them. Because if you think about it, whenever Sammy said, you're lying to me and you're lying to God, she was communicating that because of the hurt I'd caused her, we weren't right. And even more importantly, I wasn't right with God. She probably didn't fully understand or realize it at the time, but her accusations pointed to our key Christian beliefs of sin and the separation that it causes. She was alluding to a standard that neither myself or her had fully understood yet or grasped yet. Well, today, as we examine what it means when we say that we believe in the forgiveness of sins, we are going to unpack what it means to live our lives according to God's standard of righteousness. In order to do this, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31, and I'd encourage you to turn there now. As a quick note before I begin reading, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible this morning because I love the way that this version um, words the passage that we're going to be in. So, Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 21, Paul writes, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Of course he is. There is only one God, and he makes people right with himself only by faith whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so as a bit of context, the book of Romans is a letter written by the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to Christians in Rome to inform them about an upcoming trip he's going to be taking to them and to tell them about his purposes or his reasons for that visit. And in this letter, Paul outlines his full statement of beliefs and a full statement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So chapter 3, starting in verse 21, Verses 21 and 22 of Paul's letter, he maps out a a Christian framework, the Christian framework for justification, which just simply means being made right with God. And then he expounds on that framework for the rest of the chapter by explaining that being made right with God is not about keeping the requirements of the law, but rather by placing one's faith in Jesus Christ. The literary nerd in me loves the structure of Paul's writing here because it's as if verses 21 and 22 are his working thesis statement off of which he's going to build his main points and supporting details. It's concise, it's clear, and I believe it provides a perfect roadmap for seeing what we mean when we say that we believe in the forgiveness of sins. Then we come to verse 23 of our passage the hinge point of this passage, and perhaps even the entire gospel. Paul writes, For everyone has sinned. 
we all fall short of God's glorious standard. It is this verse in particular that I want to use as a launch pad for the rest of our time together this morning. Because from this verse, I see three key points unfold to help us understand the forgiveness of sins. Those points are falling short of the standard, freedom from the standard, and lastly, faith and the standard. Let's begin with that first point, falling short of the standard. And to illustrate this, I'm going to tell you another story from my adolescence. Um, Growing up in high school, I played volleyball for both a club team and for my alma mater, Boina, go Bulldogs. I know I'm making enemies with all the high schoolers in this room, right, or this amphitheater right now. Um, but I played volleyball, and every summer we had one intensive week where we, my teammates and I would have to go through these fitness and agility tests um, for one week. We would um, have to maneuver through cones and run lines ad nauseum and dive on the floor again and again and again, all while our coaches were lined up throughout the gym with clipboards and stopwatches analyzing our every move. It was really fun. Um, And um, there is one test in particular that all these years later still stands out in my mind. And this was the vertical test. It um, was a test that measured both your blocking jump and your hitting jump, how much air you could get in both of those positions. And for this test, there was a huge measuring tape adhered to one of the walls in the gym. And you would be measured against that tape. And so for the blocking vertical, you would stand right in front of the tape, smack dab in the middle with your arms partially extended like this, like you're going to go for a block. And you would, from a standing position, have to just jump cold from a standing position and see how much air you could get to measure your block. But the one that was a little bit more fun and a little bit more competitive was the hitting vertical test. Because this one required that you stand off the wall like six feet or so with your shoulder parallel to the wall and you would have to gain momentum to hit as high as you could on that measuring tape. And this, I love this because it was always so theatrical and dramatic. All my teammates and I, we would line up far away from the tape and we would all outwardly cheer each other on like, go Mandy, go Sarah. But inwardly we'd be like, I want the highest vertical out of anyone here. And I just remember it so vividly. I remember my coach saying, when it was my turn, whenever you're ready, Mandy. And then me being all dramatic and like shaking out my nerves and taking a deep breath. And then doing my like best left, right, left and smacking that wall as hard as I possibly could. And guess what? No matter how hard I tried, I could never reach the very top of that measuring tape. None of my teammates or I could. No matter how high we jumped or how long we extended our arms or how well we bent our knees, we could never reach the very top of that tape. We always fell short of the top. It's a silly analogy, but I believe a vivid picture of how utterly futile it is to try and reach God's standard of righteousness in our own strength. Many of us have heard it said that sin simply means missing the mark. And I believe this definition dovetails perfectly with Paul's prognosis that humanity will always fall short of God's glorious standard. In the beginning pages of Genesis and all throughout scripture, we see that no matter how hard we try or how high we jump or how far we extend ourselves, the sin of Adam and Eve lives in each one of us and separates us from a true and whole and right relationship with God. And we don't have to look too far or too hard to see this separation played out in our world, do we? Whether it's estranged relationships or the spread of a global pandemic, or the cries of injustice in our nation, it's quite clear that sin's grasp has reached every corner of our world, as well as the hidden corners of our human hearts. Not one of us, not one of us is untouched by the curse of sin. And as I stand here before you today, let me just say that I am absolutely included in that. I daily fall short of God's glorious standard. So, If 
all of us are under this curse of sin, if all of us fall short of God's glorious standard, then what do we do? Do we despair? Do we give up? Do we adopt a YOLO nihilistic mentality? Surprisingly, no. I love how Pastor Rich Viodas of New Life Fellowship Church in Brooklyn explains how we proceed. He writes, sin is not just something we do, but a power humanity is under. We can't educate ourselves out of its grip. We don't overcome it through progressive achievements, nor by moral consistency. The antidote for sin is found in a power outside of ourselves, the cross of Christ. This brings us to our second point this morning, freedom from the standard. Earlier this year, we studied the first half of the book of Genesis together as a church, and we talked about how God created Adam and Eve in his image, in his likeness. He created humans in his likeness and gave us access to his righteousness. Yet, when Adam and Eve rebelled, they forfeited that righteousness, that righteousness and that union with God. And here's the thing, friends. I think many of us have heard this story so many times that we don't often consider the fact that the story truly could have ended right there. God could have abandoned us. But God, who is rich in mercy, desired to restore relationship with his creation. And the way to restore that relationship was to require sacrifice to cover the sins of his people. Because God is the perfect standard of what is right, because he is the perfect and righteous judge, he cannot simply absolve the guilty by violating or altering his word or overlooking our sin. And so, in order to restore relationship with us, in order to align his people with his standard, God required sacrifice, the shedding of blood for the covering of sins. This exchanging process, the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins, is known as atonement. And in our home group study for this week, Benji walks us through this idea of atonement and specifically has us look at the day of atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. Later in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, the Lord describes the necessity of sacrifice for the covering of sins. And he says this, For the life of the body is in the blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. So let's take that verse and apply it back to Adam and Eve. Instead of death, God used the blood of an animal in exchange for the life that Adam and Eve now owed because of their sin. With the animal's fur, God covered their shame, and with its blood, he covered their sin. But we know the story. Adam and Eve continued to sin. Generations came and generations went, and they continued to sin. And so God sent the flood. But he preserved his people through Noah and his family. After the flood, Noah presented an offering of thanksgiving to the Lord, but then, eventually, Noah sinned. And the story could have ended there. Next, Abraham. God asked him to offer up his son as a sacrifice. Yet at the last minute, God intervened and signaled a greater lamb who was to come. Eventually, though, Abraham also sinned. And the story could have ended there. Then Moses. He led the people out of Egypt. And then the same pattern played out. Sacrifice, sin, sacrifice, sin, and the story could have ended there. Each and every sacrifice was an opportunity for God's people to be made right with God again. Each and every covenant with Noah and Abraham and Moses was an opportunity for humanity to choose God's standard of righteousness instead of their own. It was as if God was providing a ladder for his metaphorical measuring tape of righteousness and saying, I know you can't get there on your own. I know you can't do it in your own strength. I want you to have access to me. But each and every time we kicked the ladder out from under us, each time the solution was impermanent, each time 
we forfeited the access, the true, whole, right relationship with God. And the story could have ended there. But then, then there was Jesus. Instead of the blood of lambs and goats, Jesus went to the cross to himself become the sacrificial lamb and cover us with his blood for once and for all time. He bore our sin and offered us his righteousness through his atoning death. And friends, receiving that gift, believing in that lamb, is how we find freedom from the standard. Paul writes in verses 24 and 25 of our passage, Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. You see, in verse 23, Paul presented us with the problem. He said that there is a problem with our world and with our hearts because of sin. Yet here in verses 24 and 25, he offers the solution. And it's a solution that doesn't require straining or striving or evolving. It simply requires placing our faith in someone other than ourselves, Jesus. In his book on the Apostles' Creed, J.I. Packer gives an account of a man who was so distressed by his sin that he wrote to the great reformer Martin Luther. And Luther replied in his own letter, and instead of um, adding to this man's distress or allowing him to wallow in it, he writes these words. He wrote these words. Learn to know Christ and him crucified. Learn to sing to him and say, Lord Jesus, you are my righteousness. I am your sin. You took on what was mine. You set on me what was yours. You became what you were not, that I might become what I was not. Friends, have we truly entered into that reality? Have we moved beyond thinking of the forgiveness of sins as just a mere business transaction and into the fullness of experiencing the freedom of taking on Christ's righteousness as our own? Believing in Christ and his saving, in his saving work in our lives is not a mere status update. Believing in Christ and his work on the cross is a life-altering reality that breaks into our lives and transforms us completely if only we will let him. If only we will cling to his freedom instead of our own striving. And it is this idea of transformation that leads us to the end of our passage today. As we've looked at the forgiveness of sins through the lens of Romans 3, we've seen that Paul presents the problem. He says, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. He gives us the solution, saying that we have freedom from the standard through Christ. And lastly, Paul gives us the application, faith and the standard. So as we look at the end of this passage, Paul reasserts that forgiveness is not found or that forgiveness is found through faith alone, not through works or trying to earn our way up that metaphorical ladder of righteousness. He also communicates that our justification is a one and done deal. This means that our forgiveness, our salvation is not earned, meaning no amount of Bible reading or praying or good works can save us. And if no amount of Bible reading or praying or good works can save us, then the question is, why bother with those things at all? In other words, if we have freedom from God's glorious standard through Christ, and if our works do not contribute to our forgiveness, does that mean that we can abandon God's standard of righteousness? As Paul would say, by no means. Paul goes on to indicate in verses 29 through 31 that our faith in Jesus Christ should spur us on and catalyze us to live holy lives that are in alignment with God's standard. Listen to what he says in these verses, starting in verse 29. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Of course he is. There is only one God, and he makes people right with himself only by faith, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. 
In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. I love how commentator F.F. F. Bruce unpacks these verses. Listen to what he writes. He says, For Paul, the division between Jews and Gentiles was the basic division in the human race. The division between Jew and Gentile was one of the most unbridgeable in the ancient world. And there are other divisions which may appear larger in our eyes today. Divisions of race, nationality, class, and color. But Paul's argument is as valid in the light of our contemporary divisions as it was in the face of those of his own day. There is no distinction between East and West, Black and White, for all are equally in need of the free mercy of God and all may receive his mercy on the same terms. Isn't that good news? Do you hear what's being said here, friends, both directly and indirectly? If we have been reconciled to Christ, then we have no right to not be reconciled to one another. Faith propels us to live into a new standard. Faith leads us into a true, whole, right relationship with Christ and with others. And friends, I believe that this is a timely word for us in this cultural moment. In the midst of political and social unrest, I must confess that all too often I have entered into conversations and disagreements with an almost reflexive reaction to prove my rightness and, and others' wrongness instead of seeking reconciliation. But Christ's work on the cross leaves room for none of that. As five-year-old Sammy would suggest, if I'm not right with you, then I'm not right with God. Well, the women in my home group and I have been reading through a powerful book called Be the Bridge, Pursuing God's Heart for Racial Reconcil Reconciliation. It's written by Latasha Morrison, and I highly commend it to you. In one of the most recent chapters, chapters we read, she was talking all about forgiveness. And in order to illustrate the power of forgiveness, Latasha um, writes and gives an account from the arraignment of the murderer in the Mother Emanuel AME church shooting in 2015. She details her surprise when she read how at one point in the, rain, in the arraignment, county, the county magistrate gave the floor to the family members of the victims to address the shooter. She writes about the article she was reading, and this is what she says. She says, I read on, hoping those victims had given him a piece of their mind, but that's not what happened. Instead, Nadine Collier, whose mother was one of the nine church members killed, said, I forgive you. You took something really precious away from me. I will never talk to her ever again. I will never be able to hold her again, but I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. It hurts me, it hurts a lot of people, but God forgive you and I forgive you. Anthony Thompson, family member of victim Mira Thompson said, I forgive you and my family forgives you. We would like you to take this opportunity to repent. Repent, confess, give your life to the one who matters the most, Christ, so he can change your ways no matter what happens to you. The sister of DePayne Middleton doctor said, I'm a work in progress, and I acknowledge that I am very angry. She taught me, meaning her sister, my sister taught me that we are the family that love built. We have no room for hate, so we have to forgive. Latasha concludes by saying, the statements by the family members were bold and beautiful, a true example of the forgiveness of Christ. Friends, we may rarely have the opportunity to extend forgiveness that looks that bold and that dramatic, but we, each of us, has, have the opportunity to extend forgiveness in our own lives each and every day that is no less real or no less important. The point in all of this is that forgiveness is not possible in our own strength. Following God in his standard of righteousness is not possible in our own strength. Freedom, forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God and with one another is only possible through the cross of Christ. He became what he was not in order that we might become what we were not. We will always fall short of the righteousness of the almighty God. That is an immutable fact. 
However, we get to choose whether or not the story ends there. We get to choose if we will remain in bondage to that standard or if we would receive the forgiveness that Christ offers. And my prayer is that we would, that we would receive that forgiveness and in so doing, be transformed to walk rightly with God and with our neighbor. So whether today is the first time you've ever heard of Jesus' great love for you and his atoning sacrifice for your sins, or whether this is something you've heard several times before, I want to give us a moment to pause and consider the weight of this undeserved gift. And if you've never said yes to this gift, then I'd like to invite you to consider in the quiet of your own heart if you are ready to receive the righteousness and the freedom that comes from knowing Christ alone. And if you are ready to accept that gift, then friends, let me tell you that we are ready to celebrate with you. You can grab myself or one of our church staff on the patio after this, or you can email us at hello at sbcommunity.org, and we would love to tell you more about what, what this life-altering decision to follow Jesus means. But for all of us, no matter where we stand on this, no matter where we, where we are on this journey of understanding that Jesus has offered us forgiveness of sins. I want to give us all a moment right now to consider what the next step is for each of us today in light of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Would you bow your heads with me and listen for the Holy Spirit's words to each of us this morning? Well, friends, Jesus' life-changing forgiveness is represented by a meal. A meal where Jesus reminds us that his shed blood covers our sins. A meal where his broken body reminds us that he has given us access to have our broken relationship made true and whole and right with God again. So if you have accepted Jesus as Lord of your life, would you take this meal with me and grab your communion cup? We're going to start with the wafer on top. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, he also took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and eat. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you that we have freedom through your son, Jesus. We thank you that you have made a way for us to have access to you in your righteousness. We thank you that you desire relationship with us, that you desire wholeness with us, and that we can know you by knowing your son and his sacrifice on the cross. I pray that this, this word, this reminder of your forgiveness would not just be something that we hear again and quickly forget about, but that it would be something that you would daily, moment by moment, remind us the weight of it, God, that you would remind us the access and the freedom that you have given us through your son. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Mandy. What a great reminder of what we have in Christ. This great forgiveness has been offered to us. Uh, we're going to sing of that forgiveness and worship this God who has done all this for us. So uh, if you would go ahead and put your mask back on and let's stand together. We'll close our time in some songs. <coughs>
the stone is rolled away behold the empty tomb sing it out that keep, kept coming to my mind as I was listening to Mandy preach was, uh, you've probably heard it before, hurt people, hurt people. Mm-hmm. You heard that? Mm-hmm. But forgiven people forgive people. People who have been shown mercy show mercy. People like us who have been loved extravagantly can love extravagantly in return because we've received that from the Father. So we're going we're gonna to just sing one more song as we go out reminding us how extravagantly we've been loved, how completely we've been forgiven, singing about the fact that Jesus has paid it all.
Well, let's relish the forgiveness that we have received this week, and let's extend it to those around and point to the one who has been so gracious to us. Amen. Lord, bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, and turn his face towards you and grant you that peace. Uh, May we be ambassadors of that peace this week. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.